Thank you everyone for joining us for the panel discussion, Beyond Pride, Authentically Connecting with LGBTQ plus audiences. I'm Kenny Day, Senior Manager of Customer Success at Suzy, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's panel, which will be focused on how to reach LGBTQ plus audiences in authentic ways. I'm joined on stage by three powerhouse marketing leaders, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Kirk, let's start with you. Perfect. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kirk McClavick, and I'm a group strategy director at TBWA Shiat Day in Los Angeles. Um, we are a West Coast agency through and through, the, the first agency on the West Coast. And the group that I lead is specifically um, a, a group of accounts um, that's about more technical and complex businesses, the, the types of businesses that are really driving the future infrastructure of the world, cybersecurity, technology, financial services, all of that. Um, and again, I group strategy director. So a, a lot of um, what I do at the agency is in the world of research insights and ultimately defining the brand and marketing strategy. Awesome, thank you, Kirk. Tim, on to you. Hello, my name is Tim Snow. I'm the VP of Activations and Brand Partnerships at Equal Pride. Um, under our roster is Out Magazine, The Advocate uh, Plus, which is our HIV-centric, more pharma-based publication, uh, pride.com, as well as Celebrity Page. So my role with, with, uh, with Equal Pride I help brands across all categories who are trying to reach the LGBTQ consumer by putting together, you know, robust, but at the same time, truly authentic uh, marketing campaigns, speaking to the LGBTQ consumer, um, not just during Pride Month, but, but beyond. It's something that we work with our um, partners year round to, to actively reach the community throughout the year. Thanks, Tim. And last but not least, Devin. Hey, I'm Devin Velasquez. I'm an account executive at TBWA Shia Day LA with Kirk. Um, I'm also one of the co-leads of the Pride Affinity Group. Uh, um, so I worked with Kirk on the Pride Guide, which we'll be discussing today. Um, and we work to do kind of programming at the, at the office. So. Great. Well, thank you all for those introductions and so excited to be chatting with you today. So today's conversation is gonna be focused around three different areas. First up is why is it important to have dedicated LGBTQ plus marketing efforts? Then we'll talk about who is the LGBTQ plus consumer, and then we'll end with reaching LGBTQ plus consumers in market research. So first question here, why do you think it's important now more than ever to have dedicated LGBTQ plus marketing efforts? Maybe we'll start out with on this one absolutely um i think that actually the best way to start in answering a question like this is that it's uh across any kind of audience across um, any kind of brand or business we're seeing more and more the value of getting to know people uh, really closely and specifically for for who it is that they are um i think that's what all of our data-driven work is doing as we you know, segment out how a campaign is nuancing itself for every kind of audience it's reaching. Um, and I'm sure you know, everyone who's, who's tuning in for, for something like this, I, I think that's something that's top of mind for all of us um, from many different vantage points. But what I'd say about when you talk to this community specifically, um, I think that there's a, uh, an importance to keeping up with the tone and the tenor of how a brand um, shows up in a valuable and meaningful and most of all authentic way with this community. And because what defines this community is something that even though it's gotten a lot better in recent years in the, U in the US um, in terms of lived experience, what defines this community is overall in the macro picture at such a pivot point. And I think every year there are such nuances um, to what the community is experiencing. And that has a lot of implications for the way that a brand actually shows up, some of which we're going to unpack today. Thanks, Kirk. Tim, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so to, to echo what, what Kirk said there, I think, you know, it's, it's really important. Um, and as mentioned, 
you know, very nuanced because one thing that does unite us all as a community is those shared experiences. But even within those shared experiences, um, you know, there's so many different experiences and POVs that come into play and that intersectionality and really getting an understanding of, um, you know, even the, the different communities within the LGBTQ community and how you're speaking to, to them both broadly as well as, as, as well as specifically and more intimately around issues that are, say, for instance, impacting uh, trans youth, for instance. And, you know, as Kirk, Kirk echoed, kind of how companies are showing up uh, both during Pride Month and beyond and not just how you're marketing to this community, but kind of the stances that you're taking um, and how you're supporting outside of, you know, just recognizing that they're people that you need to market to. Um, and I think another thing that, you know, just matter of fact and to, to address it straight on is also the purchasing power of the uh, LGBTQ community and, um, and our brand loyalty. And so that's two things that also really separates us from, uh, you know, a different, a different group of folks that, that you may be trying to reach is, you know, we've got the money to spend as well. So if you're a brand, um, you know, that's something that you're just kind of leaving on the table if you're not talking to us, but at the same time, we're also paying close attention on what you're saying. So. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that one. And Devin, why do you think it's important? Um, just to kind of echo all of that, I mean, you know, pandering to this community is going to do more harm than good. Um, as with a lot of, you know, diverse groups, people have stopped kind of accepting just a little bit of representation uh, one month of the year. Um, and, you know, something we found in our research, something you can find in your day to day life, like, um, People want you to create a corporate culture that stands with their values. They want you to, um, uh, and that involves inclusive uh, hiring, that involves, you know, going beyond just donations, that involves um, taking a stand on political issues, and not just when it's convenient, but year round um, and making, you know, year round commitments. So I think um, the importance of this group is, I mean, if you make a wrong move, if you seem like you're pandering, that's, yeah, like I said, gonna do you more harm than good. People um, will not shop at your place, at your place of business, um, you know, if they think that that's, that's what you're doing. So um, yeah, it can have a very serious negative effect. If I can add a little bit to that, I, I think Devin is making such a good point and and going back to what Tim was saying, and Devin with the with the comment about pandering, but also what Tim was saying about purchasing power, I think something really important for marketers to ask themselves is why? Why are we marketing and even talking about people's gender or sexual identity to them in our marketing? I put gas in the tank of my car, even though Shell, Chevron, whoever hasn't said a, a thing about my identity to me. You know, at, I buy all the time and I don't always need to be marketed to as an LGBTQ individual. Right. That doesn't have to be in every ad that ever reaches me. Um, and, and I say that because if you are going to mention it, then it's it it shouldn't just be the pandering of showing up as something that, you know, a brand that might feel a little bit more familiar to your life. But it ne it needs to have meaning and, and purpose. Why are you talking about this aspect of my identity to me? And because ultimately we are, we're talking about um, trying to increase sales often for, for an organization. So if you're going to involve my identity and an identity that for so many people in this community has been um, filled with a lot of um, negative moments in their life um, and a, a, a tough journey um, to come to embracing that identity, then uh, then show up in a, in a meaningful way. Um, 
and, and do something um, and not just uh, put rainbows on your ads, right? So uh, perhaps I'm stating the obvious, but the, the main point here is there has to be purpose for why identity is even involved in, in the branding or the marketing to begin with. Yeah, I agree there, Kirk. There has to be purpose. And if the answer to the question of why are you invoking my identity is, well, because it's June, I don't think that that's the right answer. So moving on to our next question, what do you think people misunderstand about the LGBTQ plus community? Tim, do you want to kick this one off? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, I think, you know, one thing that is is misunderstood just about the the LGBTQ community is also, I would say, a lot of, especially if you're not part of the community, um, just understanding that kind of dissonance and disconnect of what it, the impact of the issues or things facing our community and what the queer experience is, is. And we are a group of people that's very resilient, but to kind of echo what, what Kirk said is a lot, a lot of our lived experiences um, have been supported through some concepts that aren't necessarily inherent with other groups of people like the strong um, importance of chosen family and, you know, who, what family looks like to us, what relationships look like to us and those dynamics, you know, within, um, you know, outside of what a traditional family or friend group um, may look like to other folks and, and why some messaging may fall flat. Um, one thing that I have seen a lot with, with brands, um, that I've worked with and, you know, something that we always, you know, do always talk about is some of those strong themes of, of chosen family and, um, the, those themes of, you know, the resiliency of our community that we've had to lean on over the years. And I think that's something that from the outside looking in can often get confused or misrepresented, um, especially when it comes comes to marketing and um, just making sure that the issues you think are important to us are in fact issues that are important to us, or this is how is reflective of what um, truly what our community looks like, not just what you how you perceive um, the community. And that's that's where I think there can often be a disconnect. I really appreciate that. And I agree. And we're going to get into it a little bit later. But the importance of speaking to the LGBTQ plus consumers through market research, I think you just made a really great case for that. So I'm excited for that part of the discussion later. Devin, what would you add to what Tim just said? Um, I'd say probably one of the most uh, misunderstood parts of this community is that it's a very diverse community. Um, there are a lot of us who represent a lot of different interests. Uh, I mean, even if you just think about the number of letters <laughs> in it, it's each of those represents a very different group of people um, with a very different queer experience. Um, so, you know, actually in some of the research we did a surprisingly a huge number of bisexual women took our survey and a lot of them were living heterosexual lives. Um, and those women still had places where they felt a sense of pride, often the pride parade itself. Um, and, you know, compared to lesbian and gay groups, non-binary and trans groups were a lot more likely to say they felt underrepresented in advertising and media. So again, it's just a really diverse group. Um, it's hard to speak to them all at once, but it is possible to be supportive of everyone. Um, all groups wanted brands to stand up for LGBTQ political issues, as we spoke about earlier. All groups wanted companies to um, foster inclusive workplaces. So there are commitments that brands can make that matter to everyone. But it is uh, important to remember that it's not just, you know, gay men, for example. I think they can be advertised to a lot. Um, it's not just uh, lesbian women. I think that's another one that you know, we see a lot of, it's kind of easy to portray. Um, there's non-binary, there's trans, there's a lot, so. 
I appreciate you sharing that. And Kirk, do you have anything to add about what people may misunderstand about the LGBTQ plus community in consumer? Uh, well, it, you know, we what what Devin was just touching on um, was actually just such a uh, interesting thing for us to find when we when it came to how do you even define this community? Um, to to what Devin was saying, that a number of respondents who are all you know, people who self-select, people who raised their hand that they had some kind of non-straight sexuality or um, uh, or non-cis gender identity, um, just anyone in the LGBTQ umbrella. And a number of those people were on the outside, perhaps, living what might not necessarily be an obviously queer life. Um, and so the definition of this community is um, a really nebulous concept. Is, is it a community in terms of who publicly gather together in queer spaces? Is it a community in terms of who takes part in um, participating in, in cause related things? Or is it just about who privately identifies in certain ways? And and there's a, a gap in between public identity and private identity. Um, so it, it raised a lot of questions for us too, of uh, when, you're, when you're even referring to this as a group, um, that there's even need to define for yourself what that group is, in, at least on a case-by-case -case basis um, for whatever you're trying to tackle. Well, I think that's been a great segue into our next topic, which is who is the LGBTQ plus consumer? So Kirk, I know that you just launched um, some new research in collaboration with Susie and Equal Pride about um, LGBTQ plus audiences. Would love if you can share some high level learnings from that research. Absolutely. So um, this was all overall from a perspective, a hypothesis that we <laughs> We were not surprised to have confirmed that there is room for us to do better um, and that we're here to help our work. And by our work, I mean us as marketers, as brand creators, as business leaders, help our, our work do better in how it meaningfully shows up in people's lives. And in this case, the LGBTQ consumer. So when we when we got together um, as TBWA Shiat Day plus Susie, plus um, equal pride. Our goal here was to, through a survey, identify where there were gaps um, in between people and brand experiences um, and how brands could show up in, and media could show up in more meaningful ways. Um, it was a, a thousand people and uh, to the point that Devin and I were just talking about, it was really interesting to slice that data in different ways because there's such diversity within the LGBTQ community. And part of our goal in setting setting out here was um, a hypothesis that there would be differences in how different identities inside of the community experience um, advertising and marketing and all of that. Sure enough, there was, um, but it was a little bit different than we expected. Um, so I, I want to hit some of the some of the key learnings from that survey here. Um, one way of that people wanted our work to do better was that they wanted to see themselves more reflected in the work. Um, only about a third of LGBTQ respondents felt like their LGBTQ identity was well represented in advertising and marketing. And we have a whole host of other um, prior to this study of a whole host of research about how much representation does matter. Um, so don't I don't mean to leave that foundation out here, um, but just taking that as a given, then looking at this stat, that two out of three don't um, feel like it, they're well represented or that this part of their identity is well represented. Um, that's something to take note of and it kind of opens the door to, okay, um, what are the nuances inside of that? And, and do they want to be better represented? Um, so that led us to this next step. 57% agreed that advertising to the LGBTQ community played into stereotypes and cliches. Um, and so it's, 
getting back to that point earlier of if you're going to show up, then show up right. It's better to not even get into the, an aspect of somebody's identity that can be such a um, sensitive topic for better in, in good ways and in and in potentially bad ways. Then it's better to not even get into that than to get into that in the wrong way. And we see that time and time again with brands that have all kinds of backlash. And our purpose here isn't to say, hey, brands, you should be scared, but it is to say, hey, brands, stop and ask yourself, why am I doing this? And how? And, and if I have good intent, then um, have I checked with the community about the way in which I am actually trying to connect with them? Devin, do you want to speak to some of these other uh, findings that we had in the survey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, like Kirk said, you know, also part of our hypothesis is just, we obviously have a lot of um, experience as LGBTQ plus people on the coasts. And we wanted to see what it was like uh, for everyone else across America um, to see if they had the same interest in us, if, if they felt pride in the same way. So um, thankfully, everyone seems to kind of agree on these uh, three buckets that Kirk already kind of touched on. 55% uh, of LGBTQ plus people said that advertising meant to reach um, the, the community felt like talking the talk without walking the walk. Um, so again, as Kirk touched on, just kind of like making sure that the reason you're doing this is, is you're, you're heart, your money, your mind, it's all in the right place. <laughs> um, and then from there, more consistency. So making sure uh, for four out of five LGBTQ plus people said it's important that brands show their commitment beyond major moments like pride. Um, again, commitments that you can make that you can follow up on a year later that you can continue to do uh, consistently so that it becomes part of your, not just brand identity, but like your company identity um, that this is something that you stand for, I think is, is just important for everyone. So, um, thankfully that was, that was consistent data <laughs> across the board. And I'll hand it back over to you, Kirk, for the next slide. Awesome. So that was, those were just some of the highlights. Um, and when we publish, um, We'll, we'll get into even more details with with other insights that were pulled from the survey. But that was from the quantitative side of things. It was really important for us to say, hey, we don't just want to be, you know, marketers inside of our walls reading survey data and that being the source of of this perspective. Um, so we also that's this is part of why we partnered with the Equal Pride team to pull in more of that qualitative aspect as well. Um, and Tim can speak to some of the uh, amazing people um, who gave us their perspective here. Yeah, absolutely. So when we came together on this project and in, in tandem, um, the advocate, which is um, our more political publication that has been around since the 60s, that it was a vehicle and continues to to be that information resource um, for the LGBTQ community and, and really addressing a lot of the issues that face our community on a on a day to day basis. And so when we partnered up for this, um, we and then in our upcoming issue, we'll be having um, highlighting 20 advocates for change. And these are change makers from across the country representing various, you know, a diverse group of folks, different background, different queer experiences, um, and the, the active change that, that they're bringing to their local communities and as well as uh, the LGBTQ community as a whole. Um, the first, first one we, we, we polled um, and brought some of these same, same questions that in addition to gaining the research through, um, the through Susie and working with Shiat, we additionally went out to these advocates for change and asked them what they would like to see um, from brands and to really reinforce a lot of these um, a lot of these findings and that we worked on together to pull pull into these principles for y'all. 
Um, so Samir, Samir is the founder of the Empathy Project at the age of 14. Um, he did a lot of work and actually put out a book just as far as really addressing head on just LGBTQ bullet bullying in high schools and and wrote um, read this save lives a teacher's guide to creating safer classrooms for LGBTQ students um, and is now very active um, just as far as this advocacy for work he's a just incredible person that I had the opportunity to speak to um, while we were covering the shoot um, and is absolutely on fire and I and expect to see wonderful things from him um, as he continues to kind of be a trailblazer for our community. Zoe Luna is a transgender Latina activist. Um, again, highlighted as one of our advocates uh, for change this year. She has been um, really not just as far as her professional roles in creating that trans visibility in Hollywood, but at the same time does a ton of advocacy work for LGBTQ youth, specifically trans, and, and really speaking out against those issues. Jillian Orr is a public speaker and BYU grad. Um, she came onto our radar um, during while she was in college and BYU as part of their honor code um, had woven in you know, LGBTQ relationships, and that was potentially rights for them to take, strip you of, of your degree and keep you from graduating. You know, since then, um, she's become very active, uh, active in the space, continuing on with that, that advocacy um, there in Utah, as well as online. Miles Mugler is a New York City-based activist model um, and really active in the ballroom scene. Um, but I, similar, similarly to these other act, advocates outside of, you know, their pro professional work and taking up space for the LGBTQ community and specifically um, how they represent and, and where they come from and that intersectionality, again, is very active in, um, in their local community there in New York, as well as their ball house. And again, being able to tap into this diverse group of folks, but at the same time, people who are really at the pulse of what's happening within their local communities and being able to layer that with insights as it pertains to brands and representation has been incredible. Rima, uh, is, she, she and her partner um, started started this podcast, but as well as a member of uh, my team here at Equal Pride. And, you know, for me, having Rima as a resource, not just to have, you know, one thing that has been in, that's important to us at Equal Pride is the diversity of also, you know, our employees, our staff, and and really how we're able to bring that value to brands. And and Rima is is exactly that. She brings fresh perspectives as well as, you know, her own queer experience to the table as she applies that both to working with brands, but also the work that she does in her community in Los Angeles. So those are our five advocates for change um, that as part of this program, we're really leaning in and have asked for their expertise to really help shape these principles that I think Kirk's gonna dive into next. Awesome. Okay, so we've talked about some highlights from the research findings. We've talked about these leaders who we had conversations with who gave us some really candid takes. Um, the, when we published the piece on this, um, some of their quotes are just like hit to the heart of things, like, you know, no holds barred in, in a really helpful way. But all of that led us to five guiding principles. Again, our goal here isn't um, to scare brands and say you shouldn't, but it's to say, hey, it's awesome that you want to do this. If you're gonna, here, here are five considerations. Um, and I, I think what we found here was actually super interesting for us and has already been useful in, um, in some of the work that, you know, we were even doing throughout the last couple of months. Um, the first one was commitments 
over calendars. This was all about what, what was so clear from the research um, and from the people that we talked to was, hey, this is not just a message for a month. This is not about like putting a, a nice little creative asset out there in, in June or just you know putting another product on shelf. That's awesome. But that's got to be part of a bigger picture. What we want to see to that point that Devin made earlier around we, we had that stat of skepticism of talking the talk without companies also walking the walk. People wanted to see a, a year-round commitment. Um, this was, you know, affirming what uh, we, a few of us had heard from different angles previously. Um, Tim and the Equal Pride team have a whole principle about, you know, Pride 365 that's about having that year that year round view and not just a, a June centric view or a June only view. Um, and so this is the one that we wanted to start with this one because it's just the most foundational um, that, that for a brand to, to show up in a meaningful way with this audience has to be a, a year round commitment um, and not just a calendar. Here's why I think uh, just more proof that that matters is a lot of brands who have put out messaging that has been on its own, you know, perfectly fine, um, but did not couple that messaging with proof or reference of what their actions are, what their commitments are. Even those brands, they might have a hundred on the, you know, from the uh, a 100 score from the HRC, they might be doing all the right things, but when they put out just their voice and didn't couple, couple that with, proof of their actions, even those brands have gotten called out. Now, if you pause for a second, then it's, should, should they be called out? No. Uh, but the reality is that they're speaking to a community that has had, uh, had to put up with so much um, from so many brands, rainbow washing, and just uh, you just trying to pander to this community that a lot of people, a lot of consumers are on high alert and have a lot of doubts and questions about whether companies are doing things um, coming from the right place. And so I think that's a good lesson that uh, to always think about how your message is paired with your action. The second one was um, about how brands get ideas that reach this community. Um, and what we, what we heard, especially from the qualitative side of things, talking to these real advocates, was about the importance of collabing, collaborating, and not just never co-opting an idea. So there are a lot of people who are already leaders inside of this community, um, whether they're influencers online, whether they are trendsetters online, or if they're people who are you know, doing the work inside of a lot of community organizations. Those are the voices that brands should first turn to, to try to amplify um, before showing up with a, a, trying to appear as though it's just a message from the brand. Um, we have seen, uh, even this past month, um, a lot of frustration from the community of uh, brands who leaned into different trends um, or, or shared ideas um, that, you know, made for perfectly fine marketing material, um, but took those ideas uh, from people who were actual leaders in the community. And the reason that it's so important to amplify those is again, because as a brand, it, ultimately a lot of this comes down, comes back to you're, you're going to profit from this. And so if you're going to take an idea from this community in order to supposedly show up for this community, then please amplify those voices, give people a platform who are already, um, who are already leading these ideas and leading this community. Those were the first two. Devin, do you want to speak to a couple of these other ones? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, something we've definitely spoken about already um, is just expanding queer inclusion. Um, some of the people of the people surveyed people who identified as trans, gender queer, and non-binary were on average 50% more likely to say that their gender was the most important part of their identity that they wanted to see represented in um, advertising and media targeted at the community. And they were also, when you flip the coin, the people who were most likely to say they felt the least represented. Um, so there's just a, a huge 
market there. There's a lot of people. Like we said, it's a diverse, um, it's a diverse community. And some of these stories, I mean, great that they're being told, but they've been told a lot of times. Um, and, you know, the flag was updated this year. I think it's time to kind of refresh uh, advertising and media as well um, to be just a lot more inclusive, which takes time. But um, I think we're there. And then going into number four, um, showing authentic and everyday experiences. Uh, something that once the commitments have been made, year round commitments, um, once you know, you've know you kind of proven yourself to be a brand that that's on our side, um, the most important thing in advertising and media is to show authentic moments. Um, that's kind of where everyone aligned on the most important parts we're showing um, real experiences, real traumas, real you know joys that we feel as a community because we do all feel those things. Um, and a part of that is, you know, as our friends at Equal Pride have said before, making sure that you have uh, talent on both sides of the camera, making sure you have writers and producers that are um, genuinely a part of the community so that you don't get it wrong. Um, and then using authentically queer talent, uh, because that's also important when you're trying to, <laughs> to describe these moments is to have people who've been through them before. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I think that that's, those are, those are some of the more important ones that we came up with as well. And then kicking it back over to you, Kirk. Awesome. Well, what you were just touching on, Devin, I think leads into this last one of having queer creators end to end. Um, it was super important to this audience um, in both the survey data and um, in the in the advocates that we spoke to um, to have brands show that they're committed to queer influence from concepting to creating that in every step of the way of making a message telling a story creating an experience crafting a commitment that that they were doing that with uh, real queer leaders inside of their organization too. Um, and, and, you know, just speaking from experience in how, how the realities of how you staff projects, who you have in your teams, um, sometimes this requires going outside of your own walls. Um, I, you know, in, in a past life, I was at an agency where very parallel to this, um, we were trying to show up in a meaningful way um, for the black community on behalf of a brand um, and try to actually help that brand show up and, and, and take action in a way that the community was going to appreciate and value. Um, and in that particular moment in time, I was not on a particularly ethnically or racially diverse team, um, but what helped get the work really sharp um, was making sure that our team was augmented with real voices um, from not just audience survey or not just audience insights, um, but leaders who could shed light on how to make a point of view from all of the insights that were sitting in front of them. Um, and I think that's, that's a big piece of importance here too, is that um, we all can have access to insights, um, but there are gonna be different perspectives um, and how you craft a point of view from the insights that are available to you. Uh, and, and that's where the, the amount of someone's experience um, and lived experience inside of a community or inside of an identity uh, can really make a difference. So yeah, there you have it. Those were the five principles in kind of a nutshell format. And in the coming, uh, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be uh, publishing the, the full length piece um, with a bit of a Pride Month retrospective um, and talk about, okay, June, June is, has passed now uh, for the rest of the year and um, forever onward. Uh, what can brands uh, be doing? And we'll be going deeper in each of these five principles from both a data perspective. So if you're hungry to latch onto some data for any kind of projects you're working on, there'll be a lot more of that inside of what we publish, um, and as well as uh, quotes uh, that came from these advocates for change as well.
Well, thanks so much for that. I'm really excited to see the report and I love the, the introspective look back at, okay, June is over, but let's keep in mind, we're gonna keep moving on with always including this audience moving forward. And so thank you so much for sharing that. And that is a really great segue into our last and final segment of our conversation today, which is how to reach the LGBTQ plus consumers in market research. Everything you guys were just talking about was through a market research study. And I'm sure the audience that's listening and would love to learn a little bit more about what that exactly means. So one thing that came up earlier today, I, we heard a lot about intersectionality and how the LGBTQ plus consumers come from a range of backgrounds. What should market researchers know when it comes to reaching LGBTQ plus consumers and all of their identities uh, in marketing campaigns? And I'll let Tim kick that off. Okay, yeah. So just as far as um, reaching reaching the LGBTQ community and really taking into account that lens of intersectionality, that I think, you know, is should be at the forefront of, you know, what you're thinking through and the lens that you're applying, both whether it's your market research and trying to I, from the very beginning as to trying to define who it is you're trying to speak with, but then also understanding that even within that community, there is so much intersectionality that you do need to make sure that unless you're speaking to say directly, you know, a trans experience and, you know, one thing that we're working on and what's very top of mind right now is the war on LGBTQ youth um, and trans youth. And, you know, if you're, if you're making a, say a campaign that's around that, you know, that intersectionality of experiences really bringing in, I would say, is also doing it so in a way that, you know, it rallies the whole LGBTQ community behind it by supporting the issues and recognizing that intersectionality within our own community and, and, and garnering support across all of us. Um, I think that's always, that's where, that's where you see not just, I would say it resonating with a particular group, but then it reaches the whole group. If you're paying attention to those intersectionalities and the different experiences and the issues that are, you know, potentially impacting our community can expand that reach. And similarly, whether it's not necessarily just an issue, but maybe something that as a whole, we also celebrate as a community, but recognizing the different nuances or, you know, people starting to embrace more, you know, gender fluidity and, you know, becoming that each person's queerness is kind of unique to themselves. And we def that's kind of the beautiful thing about being queer and like the intersectionality within the community is that it's kind of defined by each person and taking that into account that there's not just a rainbow wash or rainbow blanket that you can put over something that is going to effectively do that job. So it's really just getting to understand all of those pieces, but how it all connects us all. Thanks for sharing that. And Kirk, Devin, do either of you have any thoughts, especially thinking about the research that we were just talking through? Um, do you have any additional thoughts on market researchers and how they should um, connect with and reach the LGBTQ plus consumer? I think what we were talking about earlier with define the community on a case by case basis, I think because of what we saw about what a gap there is between people who are outwardly living a queer life and people whose queerness might be something that's a bit more private to them um, or a bit less apparent uh, to others. Um, and, and because there's a difference in the lived experiences as a result of those factors. Um, and uh, for example, yesterday we had um, a guest performance at our agency from uh, Betty Who, the singer, and she um, was making a, a lot of like great commentary about the difference in lived ex different queer lived experiences. All of them are valid. All of them are 
queer experiences if the person calls it their queer experience. Um, but it, it's there's such a range of what that lived experience is in terms of amount of uh, tension that one has had in their life um, as a result of their identity. So I, I think one thing in when it comes to market research is know how you want to slice your data you know we we attempted um to do this um ourselves when we were slicing the data of okay do we see any big differences when you um exclude just one particular identity so for example not that this is the, the crux of our research, but just to make this tangible, we we decided to do one view of the data where it removed um, bisexual women. And we wanted to see, hey, does that actually lead us to like meaningfully different insights? And there were places where, no, it's the same, same core sentiment. And then there were places where we were like, oh, that's actually interesting that when you when you section out particular identities, just like you would do in any other kind of survey, if you were comparing white consumers and black consumers, um, because of how much diversity there is here, even inside of the LGBTQ, um, there, it's worth slicing your data even by in individual identities inside of that. I think that's a really great point that a lot of times the LGBTQ plus community just gets lumped together as that community, when in reality there's as you say, a lot of different ways that you can slice it. And you need to kind of keep that in mind when you're trying to think, well, how do I reach this audience? Because there's nuances within that. And you brought up a great point about the um, data when it comes to bisexual women, who I think, Devin, earlier you mentioned, that was one of the more surprising parts of the research was how, um, like, what resonates with them. I'd love to know what other surprises you found within the research, if any. If any. Um, um, sorry. Um, I would say, I mean, there were some surprises, like, in total of the people we surveyed, uh, a lot of them put their sexual identity as being more important to them as seeing represented in, um, in advertising and media directed uh, than, for example, their cultural or their ethnic identity. And then when you break out the data, you, you realize that a lot of the people surveyed were white which is fine. Um, but, you know, then, for example, like Black and Asian groups felt that their cultural identity meant more to them to see represented, which makes complete and total sense. Um, so just kind of doing little things like that, making sure that uh, that we actually took a look to understand where the totals were coming from, like Kirk was saying, um, to, to kind of nuance. Because, I mean, for a second, I was like, really? <laughs> For everyone, uh, but that obviously is not the case. So um, what other surprises? I mean, that was a big one. I think um, another surprise for me was where people sent, felt the biggest sense of pride in the last year. Um, everyone kind of agreed on the pride parade. But then after that, um, for example, a lot of people agreed just like uh, seeing queer um representation in television, like screenings and movies. That's, I think, kind of a lot of people felt a sense of pride there. So it felt like maybe something, again, once you've made your commitments uh, that you could tap into as a marketer, um, just like culture, because that is, you know, for example, if there's a character on a show that's just beloved, like beloved, that that could be helpful um, for for your campaign. So things like that. I thought people would kind of feel more of a sense of pride, for example, in their in a neighborhood like West Hollywood for us here in LA, but it was not that. <laughs> and I think you brought up a great point about um, brands and, and what they can do. And we've kind of talked throughout, one of the themes running throughout was uh, market to us, market to LGBTQ plus consumers throughout the year, don't rainbow wash. So I have a question for you all. What do you think brands can and should do when it comes to the LGBTQ plus and queer movement? What is their role? I think that it's what we heard loud and clear from the community was that it's action first and foremost. Um, and it's start with your own self. Um, we gave people a list of choices and then we asked them to rank 
um, what was most important. It included things like including LGBTQ people in their media. Um, it included uh, uh, cre uh, donating to causes donating to causes for the community, um, having employees volunteer uh, for causes for the community, um, having their own internal like employer policies um, that were uh, uplifting to their own um, employees of, of LGBTQ identities. And what was resoundingly at the top of the list was start with your own employees, which was not necessarily what we thought you, we would hear from consumers, um, but there was a strong desire to get your own ship in order first before you come knocking on my door and talking to me about this part of who I am. Um, and so get your own ship in order. And then uh, next was about, uh, I believe the next one was then about like uh, words and actions for the community. And then things like donations and employees volunteering came a little bit, came a little bit lower. Um, not that those aren't worth mentioning. There's certainly moments where it, it's a helpful um, proof point of credibility to reference what your own employees are doing or that you did put some money behind things. Um, but people wanted to hear authentics, um, see that you were being good to your own people um, and then uh, representing them in your messaging. Thanks for that, Kirk. And I'd like to get Tim's perspective too. I know you work so much with the LGBTQ plus community. What do you think brands should do when thinking of reaching them? Yeah. So, you know, over, over the years, you know, I've seen a lot of brands get it right and a lot of brands get it wrong. And I, I, I think one of the, the biggest pieces here that I, you know, having worked with you know, brands big and small is really, you know, really partnering and, and leaning um, on the folks in the LGBTQ community to really help shape and bring this to life. I can tell you where the magic happens. And it's been times where even touching back onto these principles um, is, you know, having it be queer nuts to bolts, especially if that's, you know, the audience that you're trying to reach authentically. That means leveraging queer talent in front of the camera, behind the camera. Um, you know, if rec recognizing or leaning on the LGBTQ um, folks within your own company and looking at what you're doing and leaning on, on those folks to help guide any sort of LGBTQ initiative versus leaning on other folks who don't have that shame experience or are not a part of the community. Um, outside of that, and I think one thing that we haven't touched on on yet too is when you're looking at, you know, how you're planning to amplify your program and the vehicle that you know, the vehicles that you're you're leveraging to help make your campaign successful. That also goes down to are you leveraging, you know, LGBTQ marketing. How, what avenues are you tapping into to make sure that you're you're reaching um, reaching that? That includes queer media, whether it's Equal Pride or one of the other players in, in the market. Um, you know, how are you how are you amplifying that? Um, outside outside of that, you know, at the same time, while they're like when looking at talent for cam for campaigns, for instance, you know. Kurt touched on it. And I think, you know, if you were to, if you were to ask me the, you know, this, 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 these guiding principles are, are really nail on the head and what we've been also trying to reinforce and always advise our brands that we're working with um, kind of along these, along these same principles, but even, even from a talent POV, you know, there are to, to, to me and what I find most impactful is yes while you can work with an lgbtq celebrity that may have the reach and that's exactly what you know you're using them as that vehicle to help amplify that and you know there is absolutely value there but 
at the same time, what I find more impactful and what resonates and, and comes across a lot more authentic and more successful for brands is partnering with, you know, and collaborating with, you know, the LGBTQ and, and queer creatives and how, what, as part of this program, what am I doing outside of just hiring them? But am I giving them that visibility? Am I, you know, providing a platform for representation and really helping elevate queer voices um, versus, you know, going to, you know, say someone while part of the community may not be in a place that truly is at that place in their career or come from circumstances that could use the help that you're, you know, able to provide, whether it's, you know, being in your campaign or that storytelling that's, that's involved, um, you know, kind of creating that arc with your campaign. And then it touched back, touch ba it touches back to the action piece as a brand, not just internally, but at the same time, you know, the support that you are bringing to the community through how you're producing your campaigns. Um, and that action is how you're hiring your talent, you know, who, who you're using behind and in front of the camera, um, you know, who within your organization that you're allowing to maybe touch this project and really drive this forward and giving them an opportunity to shine. There's all sorts of ways that, you know, the campaign that you're working on can be above and beyond. Um, and that's where that authenticity shines through is if you've got folks making queer magic from the very beginning, collaborating together. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And this brings us to our last question. So there have been four of us talking today and we're all members of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, the last question here is, what do you want your colleagues to understand about why you are particularly passionate about this topic? I'd actually like to kick this off myself. As fun as June has been for a celebration of Pride and all of the progress we've made, the reason I'm really passionate about this topic is because it's still an active fight. You see laws being passed in Florida and all around the country. You see young trans kids struggling and being told that they're different and shouldn't be treated the same. So for me, what I'd want my Susie um, coworkers to know is that I'm passionate about it because as much as it's a celebration, it's also still a fight. And with that, I'll kick it off to Kirk. 100% agree with that, Kenny. Um, we want brands to be speaking up. I, I think maybe that's where we should have we should have started because we instantly got into the different like dimensions of how do you do this in the right way. But let it be clear that not just the four people on this line, but consumers overwhelmingly. We had a stat that was near nearly 80% of consumers saying that they have chosen um, to to um, give their dollars to brands whose words or actions um, were positively impacting the community. And almost the exact same statistic um, for the number of people who said they have chosen not to give their money um, to brands whose words or actions have hurt the community. Uh, we, when there is an active fight, um, which there will always be, uh, we do want the for brands to throw their weight behind this. Um, and it does matter. Um, it's just that one thing we have to consider in the world of marketing is that ultimately a company is trying to profit. And so that puts, uh, that necessitates a lens on the way in which um, you speak up on behalf of this community. Let it be truly on behalf of this community. Tim, what are your closing thoughts here? Um, you know, similarly, you know, touching, touching on your point, there's, you know, there's aspects of LGBTQ marketing that is the flash, the pop, the fun, the drag queens, the pride. But, you know, one thing that I have absolutely loved about, you know, being active in this space is, and especially with brands that are, are doing, doing it right is, you know, you get to see the the impact and the meaning behind the work that you're doing and how it it really is serving something larger than yourself and really helping to you know propel our community forward and you know for me who 
I, you know, I work in a lot, work across a lot of brand partnerships and campaigns, and it is, you know, I'll, it is me um, in in a lot of instances, um, you know, hiring hire, hiring camera crews, production nut to, nuts to bolts, and being able to provide folks within that our community those opportunities um, and giving them kind of their moments to shine um, and also having brands garner that support and also help be a vehicle for that um, has been truly amazing and it's and it's what continues to to get me out of bed in the morning what has you know has me involved in panels like this is really you know the opportunity and the platform to help you know, drive our community forward and, and what good is this platform if not to share it? And that's something that I always like to, to do. And last but not least, Devin, what is, what are your thoughts? Um, I have to agree with you. I think it's, it's, you know, the next generation. Um, it's, you know, your best friend's little sister just came out as gay to her mom in Texas and it didn't exactly go well. You know, it's, it's, um, the fact that that still happens. Um, and beyond that, I mean, I went into advertising because I had a long career in news before this um, because I think that brands can make a difference. I've seen it happen. Um, Colin Kaepernick and Nike comes to mind. And when that happens, when that kind of magic happens where someone like a brand really does want to use their money to do good and make money let's be real <laughs> it can make it can be um on a global scale it can make a difference and in ways that like i mean governments are really slow the news is just the same negativity over and over again and ads can be fun and cool and make a difference um for for people that are coming and beyond that i think things change um the diversity element that we've talked about a lot, that's that's a lot of a result of change within our community over the past few years um, and growth. And I think that there's room for us as as marketers to teach brands how to adapt and how to change and how to make that real difference. Um, so, yeah, that's me. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining this. And uh, sorry, we ran a few minutes over, but I hope everyone that joined uh, learned something great today and a copy of today's webinar will be available to watch in the upcoming days. Thanks so much, Kirk, Tim, and Devin. And until next time, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.